In this video, I'm going to show you how I turn one of these into one of these. So here's a piece of uh, stained glass art that was done by an acquaintance of mine and he asked me if I could create a wooden frame that uh, would house this piece of stained glass and uh, would also could be used to hang it in a window. Uh, so I thought it'd be fun to walk you through the process I used to make circular frames. <clears throat> um, this process is pretty generic, it could really apply to stained glass or it could apply to a picture of some sort or a photograph or whatever. The techniques are, are pretty much the same. So this particular piece measures roughly 20 and a half inches. It's not a perfect circle, so I'll have to sort of account for that. Um, but I, what I'm thinking is I'm going to create a uh, circular frame that'll be about two inches wide, I would say. Um, so two inches is going to come out about to here. And so you can imagine that <clears throat> the frame is going to capture the piece of stained glass and cover up most of this um, edging that's put around the object and uh, will be held into the frame with a keeper ring, which I'll show you how I do that as well. Layout is one of the most important things uh, to consider when we're trying to figure out how to make this circular frame. So I've taken the, uh, the glass and I've carefully measured the inside distance uh, from this point to this point. And I'm going to want the frame to actually capture the glass. And, and so you won't be able to see a little of any of this outside um, <clears throat> channel that goes around the glass to keep it all together that's going to be buried inside the frame. So um, I've taken a piece of uh, 4 by 4 quarter inch plywood that I'm going to use to, to do my layout on. I took and I divided up the, the, the 4 by 8 sheet and I kind of found a center line and put another center line here and then put two 45 degree angles coming off of that. And then from the center point I was able to take my uh, compass and I got a really nice big compass and first I drew the circle that represented the inside diameter of the uh, of the glass that I want of the frame I want to create then I added two inches of that that gave me the outside diameter and I drew these circles um, the next step is to figure out well how wide should the individual pieces of straight wood be that I'm going to join together using 22 and a half degree angle cuts uh, to make up the entire frame that will eventually wrap the circle out of. Um, and, you know, for, given that I've got the circle now, I can uh, pick some points, and in this particular case, I think I want an inch and a half beyond the outside diameter of the circle and put a mark here and here and connect to the line there. And that gave me a fairly generous amount of room on this side of the circle so I'd be able to run my router and cut the circle and still have some material here to support it. Um, then the inside, it's kind of the same idea. I took and went about an inch and I made a mark here and here and drew this line. And when you connect the dots, you create these segments of, uh, of solid wood that I'll have to join together with spline joints. Um, but the idea is, now I know what the length of this should be. Each one of these pieces are about 10 inches long from tip to tip. And to get enough room for me to actually create my circle, I had to figure out what the width wanted to be. And so in this particular case, it worked out to be just a little bit over four inches. So um, that's kind of the basic idea. The layout is really going to help me a lot now because I'm going to use this for several different steps as we proceed through the process. Um, the first of which is to get the, you know, the, the rough sizes for all these guys. As I actually build the frame, I'm going to use this uh, layout 
to actually make sure I've got everything placed correctly. And at some point I'm going to use this center point for my router trammel to eventually cut this. Um, but for the time being, I've got all the information I really need. Um, one more thing I should probably mention is that you can kind of see as, I, as I'm drawing half of this, of this uh, frame stock um, that each one of these angles, if you measure relative to this line, um, this angle here is 22 and a half degrees. Uh, and there's 16 22 and a half degree angles ultimately that will go around the entire circle. If I try to set my miter saw as precisely as I could to 22 and a half degrees, um, the chances of it being exactly spot on is pretty slim. Even if I'm off, let's say, a tenth of a degree with, with 22 angles, 22 times a tenth is uh, two, 2 degrees or so over the entire circumference of the circle, I'm going to have open gaps in these joints, and I don't want that. So my strategy is going to be to take and build this up into two halves. This will be one half, this will be the other half. I'll leave these guys long at each end over here uh, for both halves, and then I'll take them and actually cut them on the table saw. You'll see that a little bit later to actually create a perfect joint from both halves, and we'll spline those together. So that's the basic process. Um, next step is to go mill up some stock and make the cuts so that um, you know we're able to start proceeding to go do the spline joints. Um, I'm going to assume you know how to mill stock and you don't want to watch me doing that. Um, and uh, so you, I'll, I'll, I'll be back in a little bit and you'll, you'll, we'll take it up from the next step. Okay, so I've milled up the stock. Um, I've got it to um, <clears throat> an inch and an eighth in thickness, and I'll explain why I chose that thickness in a minute. And this is the basic idea of the layout. So each of these are cut at a 22 and a half degree angle, um, and they're going to be put together like so to go around the circle. And I've left, if this is one half of the ring, I've left this one and this one long, so after I glue it up, I'll come back later on and trim this so it's exactly straight and square with respect to its other half. Um, I've got a piece of stock here that I had left over that's the same thickness. This will come in really handy later on for um, use with the, tra with the router trammel, and you'll see that I'll drill a hole in here and position that thing right over exactly the center of this using double stick tape to hold everything in place and we'll route it out. So the stock is ready. Um, next I want to talk about the router bits I'm going to use and a little bit about the, the layout of the, uh, of the picture frame so you kind of understand what I'm doing with all these router bits. So this is a uh, cross-section if you will of the, of the frame. Um, and I've used that to kind of lay things out. So um, the width of the frame is going to be two inches across and the depth is going to be an inch and an eighth. Um, and in here I'm going to actually have a rabbit to accept the glass. And up here I'll have a keeper ring I call, um, which will capture the glass inside the rabbit so once it's put in it'll never come apart and I'll hook it in with screws. Um, I'm going to have a 3 16 inch spline joint at each one of the intersections and that's going to add tremendous strength um, to, the, uh, to each joint so that it'll be quite strong when we glue it up. I'm t I chose 3 16 because I wanted to position that spline joint about a sixteenth of an inch or so below the bottom of the rabbit that will be holding the frame. So I really don't want this spline joint being up too high. So it's actually a little bit lower than the center line of the, of the, of the frame stock, but that's okay. It's still going to do its job just fine. Um, and then I'm going to 
use a couple of router bits to put a little decorative modeling on here. Um, maybe a little cord around here and here and a little v-groove to make it kind of look a little prettier. And I'll actually do that while everything is still uh, double stick taped down to this to this guide so that I can um, go ahead and uh, um, use my router channel to cut these grooves. As far as router bits go, the first bit I'm going to use is, uh, is this. This is a 3 16 slot cutting bit um, that I'm going to use to cut the slot in each one of these guys and I'm going to make a spline so that I can slide them together and glue them together like that. Um, after that is all done and the entire frame is glued up, I'll double stick tape it down to this piece of quarter inch plywood and using the uh, um, router trammel, I'll take a, this is, I think is a 3 8 inch solid carbide router bit which I'll use to actually pass on the inside diameter and the outside diameter but I'm only going to go down about I don't know, let's say 3 eighths of an inch or so uh, and then come back and actually cut the circular frame out with a jigsaw leaving a little bit of material left over and I'll be using uh, this flush trim bit then to go ahead and actually finish it and make it look nice and smooth. Then I'm going to use a couple of uh, router bits to uh, do a little detailing to it while it's still double stick taped down to the to the piece of plywood and I, and I can still use my router channel so I'm going to cut some grooves, some V grooves in it to kind of make, make it look like little circles or half circles and then the edges will get treated with this guy. And then finally um, I'm going to use a uh, a big honking rabbiting bit that I've got that will give me a three-quarter inch um, distance from the bearing to the cutting edge and that is going to be used to first cut the outer keeper ring rabbit and then I'll come back after that's cut with a 5 16 inch rabbit bit to cut the uh, rabbit that will actually capture the, the glass. So here I have a 3 16 inch slot cutting bit set up in a zero clearance fence and um, I'm going to be running the uh, pieces of stock through uh, with the good face down. Um, so I've got them all arranged and stacked with the good face down and I'm going to go ahead and cut the slots by simply <coughs> aligning the angle up with the fence and pushing it through. Now, in this particular case, I'm not going to back this cut up with anything. I know there's going to be tear out. I really don't care because um, the part that's getting torn out is going to be removed and it's going to be waste when we get to the actual um, creating of the circle. So we'll start the router up and I'll show you how I do this. Okay, so that slot's about a little over half of an inch deep, and I'm going to make one on each face. Each, each piece is going to have a slot, and we're going to go ahead and cut all those slots, and then the next step will be to make the splines. Okay, so this is the fit I'm after. Um, I want to want it to rattle around a little, just a little bit, um, just like this, because the glue is going to take up quite a bit of space. And the tighter this is, the more difficult it'll be to actually close the joint. So you actually want a fairly loose fit. Um, the glue I'm going to be using is going to be filling the gaps. So this looks pretty good right here. I've actually got two pieces I milled up, so they're both they're both about the same thickness. So the next step is going to be to cut the splines. 
long enough so that they'll fit exactly into the slot and leave just a tiny amount of room for the glue. Okay, I set up my uh, crosscut sled um, and I have here a, a spacer that uh, is going to keep, uh, <coughs> keep me away from pinching this thing in here. So I'm going to set the distance uh, so everybody carefully set to be about an inch and made slightly under that. Take this out of here and I'm going to run this through the crosscut sled. here and you can see the joint closes just fine so I've got to cut eight of these now. Okay, I'm ready to <clears throat> glue a couple of these together. Um, before I <clears throat> to cut the splines in there I had placed numbers on each of these intersections so I can get them back together again. I liked how the grain was flowing and all that sort of thing. So now, the problem is, how do I, how do I glue this spline in and clamp this together? Um, and the answer is I don't. Um, one of the marvelous uses for hot animal hide glue is that it is uh, an amazingly quick glue to tack, and uh, you don't necessarily have to clamp with animal high glue. Um, you just have to hold it together long enough for the glue to set up and start to grab. And so uh, I could have come up with a system for clamping these together I suppose and I could have gone through all of the trouble of maybe cutting notches or gluing little things on that I could clamp with and whatever but this is just a much simpler way of doing it and it, it works very very well. So. Uh, I'm going to quickly do one of these and show you the process. So what I'm going to do actually is I'm going to set up a couple of little blocks here so that I can, after I glue it, and I can just set it on here and let it, and let it dry uh, after it grabs. Uh, and what I'm going to do then is, um, and I have this high glue prepared, um, and uh, if you don't know about high glue, there's lots of sources on the internet that will kind of uh, walk you through uh, how to use it and the, how to make it and that sort of thing. I've got this fairly runny. Um, you could vary the thickness of the high glue depending on your mixture of uh, water to uh, the glue granules and uh, you can kind of get it in different viscosities. So for this particular application, you can kind of see I sort of want it, you know, pretty, pretty liquidy. Um, because I don't want to have to fight the glue when I go to close this joint. So I've got a cheap disposable brush. There's nothing special about this brush. And all I want to do is get the glue on the joint. I don't really care if I, if my glue smushes out or on the face. It's very easy to clean this stuff up. Um, stick one of the, and since there is water in high glue, it will cause the joints to swell. So you have to kind of be aware of that. That's why I wanted to give myself a little bit of extra space. So there's a little on here and a little on here. I should have put gloves on. I got that glue on the end grain. And now I'm going to put it together and get it lined up how I want it. And then just hold it here for about a minute. So I'm not sure I'm going to make you watch me hold this for a minute. I'll probably edit this out and shorten it up. But after about a minute, this glue is going to quickly gel and it'll effectively grab the joint and uh, it won't require any further clamping pressure. Part of the trick of this is to make sure you've got enough play with your spline so that you can actually slip this joint together because you really can't use any mechanical force strictly relying on the uh, slip fit. So there it's, it's, it's begun to gel. It's still pretty goopy, but in a couple of hours it'll, it'll be virtually impossible to take this joint apart. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk around this, uh, each of the two half circles 
and glue up the two half circles and when I'm done with that we'll come back and we'll pick it up from there. Okay so I've just uh, completed the final glue up of each of the half circles and just to kind of give you an idea. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take each of the pieces that I just glued up and I'm going to carefully set them on my drawing and get them to line up as closely as I can. There's going to be a little bit of sloppiness because um, I may not have gotten the thicknesses as exact or or whatever, but I'm just going to kind of fuss with this and get it as close as I can. It looks pretty good. And now I'm going to take a pencil and I'm going to make a mark on this piece where it intersects with this line here and then here and over here. And that basically gives me the information that I need to take this now to the table saw and make a cut right across here on both pieces. So that will be the next step. Okay, so I've just ripped an edge with my table saw fence set way over there, and I've got a nice straight line here. So I got my straight edge, I put some double sided tape down, and I'm going to use that double sided tape to stick it now down to this piece of plywood. This tape is more than strong enough for this cut. It's a, it's a very tough stuff to get off once you get it stuck. Okay. So now these are the lines that I drew earlier. And what I'm going to do very carefully, very easily see this inside line. And I'm going to get these to line up right on that, right on that edge, and then set it down so that the tape will grab right about there. And I'll just put some pressure on it. So this is the edge I ripped. Um, I've now got this lined up. So now all I have to do is set the height of the saw blade so that it will cut. Like so. And run this back through the table saw one more time. Be very careful with this. The trick with ripping a wide piece of uh, plywood is really to watch this side. Be aware where the blade is, but you always want to watch this side and make sure that your, your wood is tight against the fence. If you pay too much attention to the blade, you're going to end up potentially cocking the piece and bad things will happen. So here we go. Okay, so there's a perfect cut. Do the same thing to the other side, and then we'll go over to the router table and we'll cut the spline.
Okay, so I've just done a dry fit, and even though I don't have to, this time I can use some clamps to kind of hold it together. So just wanted to check and make sure that uh, the joints all close and everything looks good, which it does. So now I can take off my clamps. I can go ahead and actually do glue this thing up. Same pot of high glue. I've reheated it. Um, added a little bit of a uh, little bit more glue to it. Um, you can do this a couple of times before it gets. See, the biggest problem with this stuff is it's really smelly. Um, again, I don't really care that much about going slopping this stuff all over because I know it's very easy to clean up. Something on the splines here. Got a fairly generous amount of time to work this, so I'm not super rushed. Um, but on the other hand, I don't want to dawdle too much because it will set up fairly quickly. And when it does, it grabs really fast. Okay, so there's that guy. Let's put a little glue in here. Big mess, big mess. This is one time when neatness really doesn't count. Interestingly enough, high glue really doesn't interfere with the finish at all. Um, what you don't sand off uh, can be removed a variety of ways. The easiest way is just with some warm water and a rag. It actually does a fairly decent job. I'm just going to get this aligned, put on my clamps. I'm not exactly clamping exactly where I'd like to because the joint is right here and I prefer to be able to go right across it, but I think for what I'm doing, I don't need a ton of pressure. This glue will set up really without clamping pressure. All I'm trying to do is hold it in place and give the glue a chance to set up and tack. And once it does that, it's not gonna be going anywhere. Okay, so we'll just give this uh, overnight to dry and come back and uh, go on with the next step. Okay, so I finished gluing up my, uh, my ring. Um, joints all came out great. Um, it's uh, been sanded uh, to uh, 180 grit and I sanded it now because as you'll see in a little while I'm actually going to be doing some finish routing on this thing, put some patterns in it. Um, and I want to get the sanding out of the way and I'm going to do that before I actually remove it from this board. It's going to be eventually stuck to here. But the first step now is going to be to set the distance of my, my router trammel guide here to the inner diameter of the circle that I want to make. So I'm going to take my this is a 3 seconds inch drill bit, which is what the uh, router guide wants. Okay, and now I'm going to use that to properly set up the distance of the router bit. So, I've got, this is going to be the inner diameter, this is the outer diameter, so to set the inner diameter I have to take and set my router bit so that it's just touching the line. 
So, and I'm actually going to try to split the line. That looks pretty good. And just lower it to be sure. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a pencil line, so it's not hyper accurate, but it should be good enough for this. Tighten this down really good. And so now I've established my my distance from the center point to the router bit so I can cut that. Um, this drawing now has to be turned into a, uh, into a fixture of sorts where I'm actually going to do the work. So the first step, now that I've got this set, I can take this out of here, put it on the side. The first step is going to be to first of all figure out the correct orientation of this because I, if you remember I have the splines a little bit higher than dead center and the reason for that is because that's going to actually represent the face. So here's my setup block. So this is where the splines want to be. So this is the front of the frame. This is the back of the frame. I'm going to put double stick tape on the back of this frame and I'm going to very carefully um, stick it onto this and I'm going to kind of use for reference lines not only the outside drawing that I made, but I'm also going to use these intersections to line them up with my axes. So I'm going to put some double stick tape on this. And I'm going to be fairly generous with this double stick tape because I really don't want this thing moving. And so we're going to put a fairly decent amount on here. I find this double stick tape. It's got all kinds of uses around the shop. I probably go through a roll of this a year. Various operations. It's fairly expensive. This roll is uh, 40 bucks. But it does last a long time and uh, so versatile. Um, it's kind of a pressure sensitive tape. So the more pressure you put on the pieces you're taping together, the harder it will be to get those apart again. And sometimes it can be extremely difficult if you really put a lot of pressure on it. Okay, so now the tape is on it. And now the trick is to very carefully, before I actually set it down, I'm kind of using these lines here as a guide. And I'm setting this axis here. And then before I actually set it down, I'm going to double check. This looks okay. I'm sure that one goes okay. This one probably wants to be a little bit more like this. I'm not 100% sure that when I drew my axis, is perfectly honest with you, that they're exactly 90 degrees or exactly 45 degrees. Um, so, and I don't have to be hyper accurate with this but I do have to be fairly accurate. I think, I'll, I think I can live with that. Before I actually do any cutting, I'll double check that this is in fact okay. And I'll probably put some weight on this just to get the, uh, uh, just to get, make sure the stuff is really stuck. Now I've also got this block, which was my setup block originally. And I'm going to drill uh, a hole in here, right in the center of it. And that's going to be what the router will actually travel around. So now the problem is, how do I get this hole exactly over this hole? And uh, I'll show you a trick that uh, works really well. Here I have a little laser pointer that I have hanging from my overhead extension cord and I've hung it on there and I've put some tape on it so it's constantly on and you can see I think the little laser dot that's produced by it and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to get that so it just disappears into the hole I drilled earlier So I put some double-sided tape on this block. 
So now once again I'm going to move my work so the laser light disappears and you can see the light now and I'm going to get it so it disappears in that hole. Carefully set it down on the double sided tape and give it some pressure. Okay, so now I've got the black position and the hole position relative to the two circles I drew earlier exactly where it needs to be. And uh, if I did everything right, I should be able to route my circles. Now I'm going to set the height, the depth, if you will, to about a half of an inch. That's as deep as I really want to go with this thing. I don't need to go any deeper. I'm just going to grab my hearing protection and dust mask and get it out of the way. Okay, so I've routed the circle for the inside diameter, uh, the groove for the inside diameter, and now I want to establish the width of the frame. And so this is not as critical as this first measurement. This diameter is really the important one. Now whatever that is, I want to go about two inches wider. So I'm going to take my little ruler here make a mark at two inches. So, and now I want to adjust the router so that the inside of the bit, so in other words the bit is going to be cutting over here. So I'll make an adjustment to the router by loosening this guy up, bringing it over here, and sliding it out. So it's about like that. And I'm just going to double check to be sure I've got wood everywhere. And I do. I'm go completely around the circle. Okay. Great. So now I'm ready to cut my outside diameter. So as you can see now, I've got the uh, circle or the circular frame basically routed out. Um, before I take a jigsaw to it and cut the waste wood away, I'm going to route a couple of decorative beads. And I'll show you the bit that I've got on my router. It's kind of a kind of a beading bit for the inside center of a of an object. So I'm going to go around it with that. Um, I've made a couple of uh, marks on my frame where I want this bit to go. So I'm going to basically set it up. Cut. I'm going to put two of them in here. I think it would look kind of nice. But I unplugged it because I just hit the switch. That's why you always unplug these stupid things when you're working on them. Otherwise bad things can happen. 
Okay, so I'm going to loosen this up here and slide this thing over my mark. Let me get a little bit lowered so I can see where I'm at. And that's my mark right there. So now I'm going to bottom out the bit. This is right there. And then set my depth stop for, I don't know, not too deep. Maybe something like that. And I'll try doing this in one pass. I may, I may need to do it in two. So we'll see. Okay, I don't know how you can see this on the camera, but I've just rounded what looks like a couple of nice rounded beads in there. And eventually I'll do the same thing on the outside edges. And it's going to look very attractive. go. Looking more and more like a circular frame all the time. Now I'm going to take it over to the router table and we're going to clean up the inside edge and the, the outside edge and the inside edge. With the I used this bit made by Whiteside to flush trim both the inside and the outside of the ring and remove the waste that I left was left over from the jigsawing operation. This is a fantastic bit, um, by far and away the most expensive bit I've ever purchased. Um, I kind of really thought about it before I pulled the trigger and bought it, but I tell you it is a great, great router bit. Um, it'll flush trim and pretty much do it independently of grain direction. So in a circle like this, you can well imagine that uh, grain direction changes, um, but the bit uh, just produced a smooth cut all the way, all the way around the ring. So uh, white side bit. Okay, so I've got my three quarter inch rabbit bit in here. And this is a very big bit. And so and it's going to take away a lot of wood and so I'm going to uh, reduce the uh, depth of cut to so it's barely maybe a sixteenth of an inch right now. Um, I, I, <clears throat> oak is a naturally chippy wood and uh, <clears throat> I really don't want a, any major chip outs or blowouts at this stage of the game. So I'm going to really take my time and I'm going to just take a little bit off at a time until I creep up on the depth that I need for my keeper ring. I'm also going to drop the router speed all the way down um, so that it's a safe speed for a bit this size. OK, 
Okay, so <coughs> just made a little bitty rabbit in here, so I'm going to keep on going and raising the bit until I get to the depth I need. for the keeper ring. Now I've got to make another rabbit that's going to be 5 16 of an inch deep off the inside reference face and 5 16 of an inch this way and that'll be to actually house the stained glass piece that I'm doing. So now I've switched to my uh, 3 8 inch rabbiting bit and the rabbit is actually going to begin where the keeper ring rabbit ends. So, um, this is my starting point right here, and I want to go just a shade over a quarter of an inch, actually, into this material. I remeasured the glass. So once again, I've got this set so that it's barely cutting. This is not a time for chip out. Um, there's been a lot of work that went into this thing now. I'm more than willing to take multiple passes each pass removing just a little bit of wood to minimize the chance that I'm going to get any major chip out. So here we go. Okay. Assuming you can see this on camera. So I've just started to make that second rabbit. Um, I've got a ways to go before I approach a quarter of an inch, so I'm going to be raising the bit, creeping up on it a little bit at a time until I eventually get to the depth that I want. Okay, so I hope you can see what I've done here. I've got an outer rabbit, which is going to be for the keeper ring. The keeper ring is going to go from here. It's going to be about three quarters of an inch wide. The inner rabbit is going to capture the piece of stained glass and uh, I've made the depth so that the stained glass will sit just slightly proud of this surface. So when I put the keeper ring on, it's going to grab it. So right now I'm working on uh, <clears throat> doing some sanding. I've got it sanded up to 150 grit. And I'm going to probably go up one more grit. But I wanted to take this chance to show you a couple of things. Um, First of all, I wanted to point out, and I hope you can see this on the camera, how nicely all these spline joints came out. Um, they all are closed, tight, and it, these were all accomplished with uh, animal hide glue, hot animal hide glue, without any clamping pressure. And I think that's uh, a good lesson if you ever come across a situation where you've got a... Um, clamp something and it's really difficult to do, you might want to consider hot animal hide glue. I also want to talk just briefly about how this thing is going to be hung. As you can see, I've drilled a couple of holes into the uh, frame and uh, <clears throat> the holes are going to be used to capture these, uh, this chain. So this is some uh, decorative chain that's going to be inserted into the frame here and here. Um, and it'll be hung in front of a window so the clients can have the option of either keeping it as a single loop or perhaps cutting the chain and using a couple of eye hooks in the window somehow to get it hung. The way I do that is uh, I took the outside diameter of the of the unit and I took a piece of uh, poplar I had laying around um, and I drew some I figured out where I wanted the center to be. I drew some lines on here to mark an equal distance from either side of this uh, arbitrary center point where I wanted the holes to go. Before I cut this out in a bandsaw, I took my drill press and I carefully drilled a couple of very straight holes um, into, the, uh, into each piece. 
and then uh, put a little sandpaper on here so it didn't slide around and then clamped it on to the frame and using a 3 8 inch drill bit I was able to drill these holes straight through um, so they're actually at 90 degrees relative to this imaginary horizontal line. So uh, you probably may or may not have to do that, but how you hang a circular frame can be an interesting challenge. Um, if this was a normal picture frame and it was going to be hanging on the ceiling, or on, on the ceiling, it was, if it was going to be hanging on the, uh, on the wall, it would be easy enough to simply attach a uh, little hanger clip right over here and you could just hang it that way. Um, the other trick I do is I put a couple of small holes in here. These holes are going to be for a, a screw that's going to capture the very end of the chain. So this will go into here and I'll sink a screw in there and fiddle with it until I get the screw to actually go through the center of this and uh, I'll countersink it. And it actually works very, very well uh, for this type of uh, object. Okay, let me try to explain to you what's happening. So, I'm getting ready to make the keeper ring that's going to go in this first dado, the rabbit rather, that's going to hold the glass in, which is going to go here. So the glass is going to go in this inner shelf, and the <clears throat> keeper ring is going to go right here. Um, there's about three quarters of an inch between this edge and right over here. So I'm going to make my keeper ring slightly less than, than that, probably like 11 sixteenths instead of 3 quarters. Um, and I've measured my diameter from here to here just to be absolutely sure that I've got it correct. And, uh, and that measures 21 and 3 eighths. Um, so that's half of that is going to be a radius of 10 and 11 sixteenths. So it's actually a little bit bigger than 21 and 3 eighths. Well, it's actually right there. So um, let's do it from joint to joint to be absolutely sure I've got it right. Yeah, see if I go from joint to joint, I've really got 21 and a half. So if I allow a little bit of slop in here, uh, maybe a sixteenth on either side, that'll give me 21 and 3 eighths. So if I divide that by 2, that gives me a radius of 10 and 11 sixteenths. So what I've done is I've taken my router and I've uh, kept the circle guide on here. I've replaced the half inch bit with a 5 sixteenths inch carbide bit. And I've set the distance from the inside of the router bit to the pin to be that 10 and 11 sixteenths dimension. And that's going to cut the radius out of this quarter inch plywood uh, that I need for the outside of the circle. Now when I go to cut the inside of the circle, because obviously I've got stained glass here so I can't have the inside of the circle, it has to go away, this has to be turned into a ring. When I go ahead and cut that, I'm going to change this distance and cut the inside referencing this side of the bit instead of that side of the bit. So you'll see that in a second. Um, but now what I have to do is uh, my pattern piece of plywood is now done with its life as a pattern and it's now going to become the actual keeper ring. I've got my hole that I drilled in here a long time ago and I'm going to utilize that hole again and I'm going to basically cut my ring out of this portion of it. So in order to do that, I've got a piece of sacrificial plywood that's uh, got some water damage to it, so I'm not going to do anything with it. This time I'm actually going to cut completely through the quarter inch, this piece of quarter inch um, plywood, down into the sacrificial piece. Um, and I, I have to be sure that this doesn't move around when I do this. So I know that my ring is going to come roughly out of this area in here. Um, and so I want to make sure that I have double-sided tape holding this down. I'm going to use quite a bit of double-sided tape on the back side of this to be sure that I'm capturing um, 
both the inside and the outside and you'll see why I've got to do that as I actually do the cutting because as I'm going to be cutting this out with this router bit um, everything has to stay stable including the piece I'm cutting away so I'm going to go ahead and insert some uh, double sided tape and be fairly generous with it um, and lay a bunch of pieces down and make sure that I'm covering getting the coverage I need. This is kind of a lot of tape to use, but it's it's a way to guarantee that this will stay steady and won't move. Okay. I'm just going to double check visually that my tape is covering up the circle. I'm looking on this side and I'm looking over here and I think I pretty well got it. So I'm going to take the paper off and uh, probably Okay, last, last piece. Okay, so now my tape is ready to do its job. I'm going to flip this over and get it roughly centered on this piece of sacrificial plywood and uh, stick it down. Now, I want to really make sure that it's going to be sticking, so I need some heavy weight to put on this because this is a pressure sensitive adhesive on this tape. So the heaviest and broadest weight I know of is my butt. So I'm just going to kind of sit on here and move around a little bit like this and kind of massage it in. So good. So now I know I know that it's stuck pretty well. And if I wanted to get this off right now, I'd have a hard time doing it. So that takes care of that. So now this is stuck down to my sacrificial plywood. I'm going to take a couple of clamps. plywood down to my table so it's not going to move. And the last thing I need to do is to set the depth of the of the router and so I need to release this guy and um, I want this to go down about a quarter of an inch so actually what I can do is if I bottom it out here on the workpiece, I can come over here and I can push it all the way down. And that's where I want the router to be cutting at. All right, now I'll go ahead and set this into my hole. I'm going to verify that I can go travel completely around, which I can. So now I'm going to go ahead and plug the router in and I'm going to cut the outside of the ring. So that is cut completely through, and I've got my outside of the ring cut. And now I need to change the distance. And I don't know if you noticed it on the video or not, but uh, this spiral cutting bit does quite a bit of nasty chip out on the... Uh, now this luckily is the scrap side of it, but now I'm going to cut the inside, and I really don't want this chip out. So I'm going to try climb cutting with it, at least for that first pass around, and see if that doesn't that doesn't cure that problem.
Alright. Let's see how we did. So, as you'd expect plywood to be, it chipped out like crazy, but that'll go on the inside. And let's see if we did this right or not. So my calculations are correct. This ring should pop right in here and hold a piece of our work down. And it does. It's a nice fit. Is going to work like a champ and you can see that uh, this is flush over here and uh, I'll just put some little screws in here our work will go inside there and everything okay so I'm ready to wrap this project up um, I've got a stain put on the frame and I've got a top coat put on I like to use armor seal I use the minwax stain looks very nice. When I made the frame I was well aware of the fact that I could make a perfect circle but the piece of stained glass art is by no means a perfect circle. So um, here's the top of the frame and this is where I had the two holes that I'm going to be hanging the chain from. And uh, I've used this ruler to go from seam to seam which gives me a center point and when I drilled these holes I was careful to make sure that I had a a center point reference and I'm using this to line up the most dominant image in the picture which is this cactus and uh, so now because I've made the frame ever so slightly bigger than the art object to account for the irregularity of the circle um, I'm going to I position it so I'm pretty sure it's about where I want it to be because this next step is going to make it pretty permanent. I think I can go this way just a little bit. Um, like so. And um, to hold it from shifting around when I put the keeper on, I'm just going to use some hot milk glue and put a couple of uh, little piles of glue in here. And that's going to quickly set up and that will be just enough, just enough to hold it in place so it doesn't shift around. And uh, so between the hot melt glue and the keeper ring, this thing is going to be stable for a long time. The, uh, the lifespan of stained glass is very, very long. There's stained glass objects that were made in the 10th century that are, are still um, quite beautiful in cathedrals and churches in Europe. Um, there should be no reason for this glass to come out of this frame for the next 100 or so years. So the next guy who has to do some repairs on this well, he's going to probably be mad at me because it's going to be difficult to get this out of here. But that's okay. Alright, that probably will do it. I've got enough hot milk glue and strategic spots to... Uh, I always like getting this on my hands. Um, definitely hurts. So now... Plug my glue gun, so I don't have this stuff slapping all over the place. Now the next step is to actually fasten the keeper ring. So I'm going to pop this in. This is a really good fit on this keeper ring. It's a snug fit. I actually had the ring in place when I was doing the uh, staining and top coating. And what I want to do is I want to put these. Uh, these number, I think these are number six by five eighths inch screws. I actually use these for cabinets all the time. 
and I want to uh, sink the screws in between my joints. Um, maybe every every joint I'll do that, and um, I want to be sure to keep the screw. I don't want to go over here where I could go into the glass. So I want to be sure to keep it well back and away from the glass. So um, I will do that and add the chain and I'll come back and show you the finished project. Alright, I'm not going to make you watch all eight screws, so this is the final screw. I'm careful to drill into the shelf created by the rabbit. <laughs> go crazy and drill all the way through to the outside of the frame. That would not be good. Put a little bit of a little countersink into the drive a little screw in there. So I think you can see I've got all eight screws holding the keeper ring in and uh, that is going to secure this thing for, for a very long time, hopefully forever. And uh, the front side of it looks like this. So that's the final end of the project. I uh, hope you've enjoyed watching this video. I hope you've uh, picked up some tips and tricks on how to do something like this. And uh, thank you very much for watching. Bye-bye.